Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome. <laughs> Uh, my name is Ilana, and I get the unbelievable privilege to be the moderator of today's session, which is about shifting paradigms for climate transition. And um, I have to be honest, I have this silly look on my face, and my heart is racing very fast, because three of the people that I've been very big fans of for a very long time happen to be on the panel. So if I start blushing and giggling, it's because that's what's happening. Um, and so I would love to welcome Frederic Laloux, author of Reinventing Organizations and founder of The Week, which I'm very excited that you get to share more about. Um, Frederick, before I introduce the others, how are you feeling in this moment? I'm so excited. I got to see a little bit of a camera that's showed the whole, you know, the whole room. And so I, you know, I feel like I get, that I'm part of this bigger thing, even though I'm not in the room. Yes, and you should know you are, uh, your face is actually bigger than both Indy's and mine. So you actually, when you speak, you get the whole stage, which is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, wonderful, thank you. And Melanie, uh, founder of So Science, how are you doing in this moment? I'm very good and I'm very happy to be here with you. Thank you. Yay, and welcome. And then, of course, we have Indy Joha founder and executive director of Dark Matter Labs. Um, Indy, how are you? Really privile privileged to be here. Really. Yes. Yeah, I feel the same. Um, the idea behind today's session is also to do something a little bit different. I'm aware so many of you have been part of lectures and discussions. I'm going to try and do a few things differently. So feel free to play along with whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, and also know at the end there'll be some questions for you to reflect on. Um, today's session is about shifting paradigms. And so the invitation to all of you watching, those of you at home, um, is to really reflect on your own paradigm and where the edges are of how you think and how you see the world. Um, as we arrive to the edges of our own worldview and paradigm, things can get very uncomfortable because the way that we see the world affects how we show up in the world. And if that shifts, it means that we need to shift. And so my invitation to each of you is to notice where are the edges of your own paradigm and to meet them and say, hello, edges and to start wondering what may be beyond them. And we happen to have three perspectives, ideas, human beings that represent an extraordinary array of new ways of being, seeing, and doing in the world. Um, and so I'm very, very excited to welcome you all to the edges of your own paradigms. And <laughs> with, uh, with the rest of the wonderful team on stage, I would like to start by doing something a little bit different. Um, and the idea behind this is that after the last year and a half slash lifetime slash uh, being human, um, the level of stress that we've experienced on our nervous systems have start, has started to affect the way we think and the way that we operate. And so the more we're able to regulate our own nervous systems, the more capacity we have for innovation, creativity, relationships, love, dare I say. Um, and so I thought we could take a minute to collectively regulate our nervous systems. And I'm wondering if just by a show of hands, who has ever done something to consciously regulate their own nervous system before? If you could just put your hand up. And if you could also put your hand up if you have no idea what I'm talking about. Wonderful, welcome. Um, welcome as you are. And so one of the most extraordinary ways to regulate a nervous system is through breathing and conscious breathing. Breathing also happens to do that uh, happens to be the single thing that we all do, regardless of age, race, background, ethnicity, culture, where we live, how we live, is breathing is the thing that we share. And um, I'd like to invite us to breathe together. So I'm going to teach you a very simple framework, and then we will hand over to our extraordinary guest today. Um, and so the framework, <laughs> and the NT. Okay, just so you know what the inside joke is, Indy has challenged me to have the courage to stand to do this. And so I'm going to honor Indy's invitation if Indy joins me. Okay, thank you. Um, if you would like to stand. <laughs> um, I'm going to teach you a very simple practice. It's called 478. It's been designed by a man called Dr. Andrew Weil. Um, and I like to call it the nervous system hack, which is if you're ever feeling stressed, anxious, if you can't sleep, if you're about to give a presentation, if you're going to go on a first date, 
um, that this is an unbelievable way to quickly align your nervous, nervous system and regulate it. And it's called 478 um, because it's an inhale for four counts, a hold for seven counts, and then a long, slow exhale for eight counts. In four, hold seven, exhale eight. I will do the counting. You just need to do the breathing. Feel free to participate as much as you feel comfortable with. You're going to be breathing anyway. So um, if you're happy and comfortable just to rest your eyes on the ground, or if you feel particularly courageous to close them. And you can start by taking just a moment to be entirely with yourself. You have nowhere to be and nothing to do in this moment. When you're ready, you can take a deep breath into your belly, expand into your chest, and let it all go. And then inhaling for two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale through the mouth, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale through the nose, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Last one in. And hold. And exhale. And then keeping your eyes closed or resting and coming back to your natural breathing will close by you thinking of someone or something that you feel just incredible gratitude and love towards in this moment. And let that feeling of love and gratitude fill your whole body. And take one more deep breath into that. And when you're ready, you can let it all out and open your eyes. Wonderful. Thank you for playing along. You can have a seat. Thank you for standing with me. Um, I'm curious, with a hand gesture, can you show me how that experience was for you? Any form of hand? Okay, we've got some thumbs up. We've got big thumbs up. Lots of thumbs. Good. Okay. Um, thank you. We're going to start the discussion now. As always, please remember that we have the amazing tool of Slido. Um, so feel free to add questions, comments, um, as you like, and we'll get to some of them at the end. And I want to start um, with the original uh, name of the session was a little bit different. Um, and it recently changed from paradigm shift or changing mindsets to uh, changing paradigms and shifting paradigms. And I'm wondering if, Indy, if you can speak to that shift in and of itself. Um, firstly, delighted to be here. Um, I had the pleasure of experiencing what Alana did in a retreat with a great many of, of us together. And I think one of the things that's really conscious to me is that the scale of the transformation that we're in the, mid, in the middle of is beyond an idea of something outside. It's as much about how we are and how we understand ourselves in that context. And for me, I think we often talk about paradigm shifts as something outside, but shifting paradigms is as much about ourselves as it is in the context. And I think that reconciliation was really important. And so I, I really appreciated you ho holding this space because I think we need to have really integral conversations in that, in that position. And I think this creates the platform for it. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and just also an opening question, Frederick. Um, who, who has done such an extraordinary body of work and breadth and depth of work on, on really what on paradigms in and of themselves. And I'm wondering if you can speak to what are paradigms? <laughs> Why are they important? Why are we talking about this? Yeah, there's a, a coherent a number, a number of coherent worldviews, ways that we think about the world without even thinking about it. Um, 
So ways of thinking that are invisible to us, um, because we think that's the only way that the world is working. <laughs> and anybody thinking differently is a fool. Uh, but if you look historically, you know, and, and a number of historians and philosophers and anthropologists have done that, the way we thought as human beings when we were hunter-gatherers was one coherent way. And then we had a breakthrough when we went to the age of agriculture and we started thinking in a whole new way. And for a while that felt like the only way. And then we had the scientific and industrial revolution and it brought a whole other way to think about it, a way where we maximize everything, right? And, and we're in the middle of one of these historic transitions right now. And if so many things feel confusing, it is because we're sort of leaving an old worldview that is no longer working for us. You know, we're hitting the limits everywhere, but this new worldview is just starting to come into being, right? And so I, I see this as a way of being very compassionate with ourselves. Like if, if, if you, you know, here in this room, you know, sometimes feel confused in your role as leaders, you know, you have a sense that the old way of doing is no longer working, but you're not quite sure what the new way, and everybody's looking at each other and saying like, you know, what, what should we do? Um, it's because the change is way more profound than a technical change. It's really a whole different way of looking at the world. Amazing. Thank you. Um, and Melanie, if you'd be open to us answering this in your, own, in your own version of it. Yeah, I completely agree with what Frederick just said. Um, and we see that a lot in science. Um, my background is, uh, is scientific. Uh, I, I work a lot with industrials. Um, and we have a lot of technical challenges. That's true. But I believe that the hardest challenges that we actually need to deal with now uh, are not so much technical, but actually, how do we envision the world? What do, do we want to do with it? What do we want to be uh, in 10 years, in 20 years? Um, and so it's also a bit what uh, Indy said. It's, it's really a change that has to happen inside. And so how do we relate to each other? How do we connect uh, to things that matters to us? And it's really about changing a mindset, a paradigm, um, but it's changing everything actually. Um, thank you so much, and I look forward to getting, I know each of you are going to be sharing a bit more extensively. Um, I have one more question for each of you before we do that. Um, from your own experience as human beings, obviously leaders in profound ways and pioneers, each of you, um, I'm wondering if you could just speak a few sentences about what have been your own edges and your own paradigm edges that you've then moved through. Um, just to give just a bit of a flavor before you each get to share a bit more. I don't know if, do you need a moment to think? Are you ready to? <laughs> you want to dive in? Uh, um, so many different moments in life, but I, so, there was a, one simple moment, I suppose, was the realization very, it was, I was what, 23, 24? Um, and I, I was in love with someone. And that person was amazing. But my obsession with that person meant I could not create relationships outside that situation. And it meant the work or my being was being absorbed into that relationship. And I realized at that moment in time, I could never be fully, I could not just be drawn into the gravity of one person because it was destroying everything else that I wanted to create and be part of. And that was a real reflection for who I wanted to be. And how do we hold the space for actually that plurality it was a real conscious moment for actually how zero zero was created, dark matter was created. There had to be beyond my own ego and my own singularity. And that was, that shifted my worldview, it shifted how I, my intentional space of decision of how I wanted to exist in the world and organize. Thank you. Um, and when, would you like to pass the proverbial baton to one of our guests? Um, uh, Melanie? <laughs> 
sure. Um, for me, there was a very important moment very early on in my career. Um, I was trained as a scientist, and so I was working in a, in a laboratory in Japan. Um, and I'm a specialist in uh, neurosciences and wave physics. So I was working on what we call brain-machine interfaces. So how do you make a connection between a computer and the neurons in your brain directly? Uh, it was thrilling. And in terms of science, it's really a booming field. Um, so it was great to be part of that at that moment. And as a scientist, I was really uh, happy to be part of that change. Um, but the thing is, I started to think about after the science, like what we call the valorization of research. What will happen of my results after I'm done with the lab? Um, and actually, it was in the hand of the company I was working for. And so very early on as a scientist, I thought about the consequences of my act, even if and especially when these consequences were not in my hands. So I was part of a system. And even if what I was doing uh, was only a tiny piece of the end result, I felt extremely responsible for the whole and for the, the result in the end. And that was, that was a big realization for me because I had this kind of feeling that responsibility is not only about what you do, but how you play a certain role in a bigger system. And I think that's extremely important nowadays. Thank you. Um, Frederick, um, I'm curious what yours is. Um, I had a, a coaching session one day. I was still in a very traditional career. I was um, a management consultant and I had a three hour coaching session with an amazing woman. Um, you know, she sort of slapped me all over the place. At the end, I didn't know what my name was, but it was such a profound session because I started to understand that next to the outside world, you know, the stuff that we can act on and manipulate, there was this inner world. And that became fascinating to me for a while that I could start observing myself and especially my little ego, you know, my little, you know, this little person in me that, that needed to you know, recognition and success and had fears and doubts and, and that I could just observe that and that I was, you know, and I could see myself from the outside and be compassionate with that little thing, but then also grow beyond it. And so this realization that there was a deeper part of me beyond my ego, and I think that's true for all of us, um, opened me up to so much more big, you know, interesting and more, you know, broader questions than the ones that I could look at before. Um, and that was just so incredibly joyful and, and freeing and it just sent me on this, on this wonderful journey. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the joyful and freeing nature of that. Um, I think an ego's perspective might have a different one before, <laughs> before one can move past it and observe it. Um, thank you also for honest answers. Um, I'm wondering if uh, moving from those, we start to shift to each of you sharing what you sense is possible and how do we move, how do we move from here? Um, and Frederick, I know, I know if you are prompted and ready to go first, that would be wonderful. Um, and you can take the time you need. Yeah. Um, yeah, moving more specifically into the, the climate space that has been a space that I've been sort of obsessing about for a few years now. Um, I don't know if it, maybe this is a question some of you share. It's like, you know, we're, we're heading for this abyss. We're heading for this catastrophe. And yet we don't seem to wake up. We don't seem to do anything meaningful about it. Um, and, and, and this is very personal. Like a lot of us, I think, feel sort of powerless, feel too small, don't really know what to do, even if we're in leadership positions. Like I know a lot of senior leaders, you know, their children are marching for the future. And, you know, the children are looking to them and say, like, you know, you have power, do something. And, and you know, we, we don't, often don't know what, what to do. And so this has been this focus of mine, like, what's wrong with us? Like, what's wrong with these human beings? Like, why don't we wake up? And 
and you know, looking into it, I, I, my conclusion is I think there's nothing wrong with us human beings. I think I want wrong playbook to get us to mobilize around this big issue. Um, and, you know, the, the playbook we're using, you know, is, you know, give people the facts and they will wake up and act, right? And the problem is, you know, this, this playbook has never really worked, right? It hasn't worked against smoking. It hasn't worked against AIDS. It hasn't worked against drugs, against teen pregnancy. And yet, this is the playbook we use over and over again and hope that that will change what people do, right? One more IPCC report, you know, scientists, you know, getting ever louder around this. And then we're surprised that nothing happens. Well, yeah, you know, this playbook has never really worked. And so I have become fascinated by, like, so what could work? And to look in particular in, you know, in, in, in two areas, you know, is to look at, you know, how did past successful movements, the suffragettes and the civil rights and the end of communism, like, how did they mobilize people in the face of, of fear and apathy? You know, people who could also feel like they're too small, you know, that nothing they will do could matter. And yet they managed to mobilize people. And then there's this whole field of social science that has really interesting things to tell us around, you know, the communication of, of climate change and the psychology and why do we deal with it or not deal with it. Um, and so I believe that there's a much better playbook than give people the facts and they will wake up and act. And I want to share a few principles with you that I think are really interesting for all of us who are looking for, um, for large-scale change, even beyond climate change. Um, and one of them is, <laughs> I don't know why it's giving me two at the same time. Yeah, here we go. Um, is that the old playbook tells us it's all about information. And I think a better playbook tells us it's not so much about information, but a space where we can actually emotionally reckon with this. The reason most of us don't deal with climate change is we feel like, Boo, this is so horrible, this is overwhelming. I, I, wanna, I need to protect myself from it. So we need to create spaces where it's safe for us to actually find out how bad is it and what can we do? And until we create these spaces, it's actually a rational thing not to deal with it because it's going to overwhelm us. <laughs> Another thing is, this is somehow too sensitive, so I'm looking at number two here, um, is that we keep going for top-down messaging, right? We'll have experts and scientists tell us what we need to do. And we know that that is not nearly as powerful as peer influence, right? We're social animals. Like, if all of my friends smoke and think it's cool, it's likely I'm going to smoke. If all of my friends think that smoking is idiotic, most likely I'm going to think smoking is idiotic, you know. Experts don't have that same power. So peer influence and my sense of identity, am I a cool person that smokes or not, like, is way more important. And we need to harness that for climate change, um, The next one is that the corollary of that is that, you know, um, if somebody could click for me, yeah, um, is instead of focusing messages on individuals and looking at individuals, we need to look at us people in our context, me and my friends, you and your family, you and your colleagues, right? If we want to influence CEOs to do something about climate change, we need to influence their CEO friends because one single CEO it's very hard for him or her to have the courage to do something if the other CEOs don't move, right? So we need to look at collective spaces. Um, another thing is that we've been focusing on fear and guilt, and we know these are very poor motivators, that what really motivates people, you know, is pride, courage, and joy. That is what motivates people for the long term. So how do we mobilize for climate with pride, courage, and joy? Right? And... The last one is we tend to focus to very narrow call to actions, right? Let tell people exactly small things they can do, and, and sure, they're important. But what we know is much more important is this change of paradigm that we've talked about, this change of narrative. Is, you know, real change happens when people abandon an old story they no longer believe in and move towards a better story that serves their time, right? And so these are some principles that I think you know, are really important if we want to get large-scale mobilization 
for the climate. And, and so this is at the heart of the week, which is, you know, this project that I'm, you know, doing with um, a number of people, my wife and a, and a growing group of people, is to put this at the heart of mobilizing millions of people for, for climate change. Um, and it looks something like this. Um, we take groups of people, so groups of friends, groups of, you know, family, um, people in their workplaces, people in their churches, um, to spend three sessions together that leads them through an emotional you. Um, and so, you know, every time people watch a one-hour documentary film that's carefully scripted, and then they have group conversations where the social norms start to shift. So the first time is brutal. It's really hard. It shows you everything you've been trying to avoid about the topic. But it creates a space where it's safe enough for people to actually feel, to go through grief, through shock, through anger, through sadness. And then to talk about it with their friends and see that their friends are sad and angry too. And suddenly it shifts the social norm. Now we can finally talk about it and I no longer need to protect myself from it. And then you have to sit with it for 24 hours. You can't binge watch. And you sit with this and it, you, know, you marinate in it. And then you come back for the second night at the bottom of this U where we go into the, what's this old story that brought us into this mess? And what's this more joyful story that is emerging that promises you know, a better future? And again, people have conversations and it changes you know, their paradigm, the way they look at things. And then 24 hours later, they come back for the third. And we just share tons of examples of people who've had the courage to know. They've gone through some form of grief. They've stopped protecting themselves. But actually, their lives got richer because they finally do something about it. Their life is meaningful. They've meeting, you know, they're meeting interesting friends. And so at the end of the third night, people are super excited. And we've tested this in prototype, and it works amazingly. Um, and then after that, we offer people you know, two to six months of support where these groups can continue meeting regularly and they celebrate their successes and people actually become active beyond things that they thought were possible before because they're not alone, they have their group of friends, because they have a deep change of narrative because they've been able to process things emotionally. Um, and, you know, the, it, it, it works amazingly and it, it, we've, we've tried this for the broad middle, right? So not the climate deniers, not the small chunk of people who are deeply activated, who are already on the streets, but this large chunk of all of us, like of the people who are alarmed, concerned, and on the fence. So we know that there's this big topic, but we've still been you know, pushing it away. Um, and we've, <laughs> this is frustrating. Um, yes, this is the one. Um, and we've tested this. So we're, you know, we're in the process of creating these three films and to test them we've um, had a number of people a few hundred people now go through three evenings with us where this is my wife and me reading the scripts of the future films on a zoom call um, and so it's a very boring format but it, it it's amazing like you know it, we found out that people are looking for a space to engage and finally go through the emotions of this you know if this is a safe space um, the latest um, prototype with it was in France with 60 people. And, you know, in the last two months, you know, 60 new groups have asked us for the recording. You know, there's like now 300 or 400 people who've watched it. So we've gone from 60 to 400 people. It's because people are so deeply touched and go like, finally, I can talk about this, that they keep inviting their family and friends and their colleagues and they bring it to their workplace. And, and so, you know, I, I think we have here... Uh, you know, just a much better playbook to engage at, at a much deeper level with this topic. And, and we're, you know, trying to create different versions of this, the week at home that you watch with your friends, the week at school that, you know, university students do, uh, the week at work. We're prototyping this with uh, Novartis and Decathlon and Sodexo, like really large employers who might bring this to their 100,000 employees to, you know, get like just masses of people to really engage around the topic and, and the week at faith in, you know, with the Catholic church, you know, in, in parishes. Um, so we were trying to create a tool that is based on this new playbook. And I just wanted to give you just concrete examples just to show there are different ways to look at how we engage people. And I think this, this new playbook um, works so much, so much better. Um, so that's in a nutshell, you know, what I'm, I'm working on, um, on the next slide, you know, is my, my email, um, if you want to, you know, talk about this, um, 
There's also Lucy, um, her email, you know, where we're looking actively, I'm just going to make a blunt pitch for, you know, fundraising, where we're looking for philanthropic donations to help us create these movies, because movies are expensive. Um, and by the way, in the room, there is a friend of mine, Herman Arnold. I don't know, Herman, if you can raise your arm, you know, he knows, you know, a lot about the week too. And so, you know, feel free to talk to Herman um, if you're interested in this topic or just reach out to me. Um, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation um, around this. Thank you so much, Frederick, and thank you for your work uh, and your book. Highly recommended if you haven't read it yet. I have one question before we move on to Melanie. Um, in a sentence or two, how, what is the new narrative? Um, as far as you can tell, the, what is the most potent and powerful new narrative? Yeah, so we, we, let me start with the, the old narrative, right, is the one that we inherited from the Industrial Scientific Revolution, which is a narrative that more is always better. It's sort of the story of more, right, that in order to be happy and safe, you know, more is better. Um, and we're reaching the limits of that. We're now seeing the destructiveness of that story. Um, and this new story that is emerging that you see in regenerative agriculture versus, in, you know, industrial agriculture, that you see in renewable energy versus, you know, um, the fossil fuel energy that you see in new ways of sharing versus modes of consumption um, is a story of reweaving connections. Um, is that we're not individualized machines, you know, we humans living next to each other, that plants are not individualized machines that you grow like, you know, machines in the field, but that we're these relational beings and that our real happiness and safety comes from our friendships, comes from our relationships, comes from being in community together. Um, another way to say that is that we're much more deeply interdependent um, mm. than we give ourselves credit for now. Thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful to meet you and be with you. Um, I'm wondering, Melanie, if you're ready to take it from there. What do you sense is possible yeah. and how do we move forward? Um, I'm really, really happy to talk um, after Frederick because I think a lot of what I'm about to say really resonates um, with was just said, the, the engagement, the community, uh, the need for others too. Uh, but I'm talking tackling change from maybe another perspective, another problem. Um, we all know we have to change, but we're very prompt to wait for others to change first. Um, strangely enough, I believe the way the scientific production system is currently reinventing itself can teach us a very crucial lesson about how to change. Um, I was saying I'm the founder of Society, a company that is specialized in responsible research and innovation. Our main activity is launching collaborative research program that can answer social and environmental challenges. These programs allow innovators from all over the world to propose solutions to issues like plastic waste, soil depletion, water quality, nutritional valorization of food waste, you name it. But if you compare our program to other startups, challenges, or research call for projects, what will strike you is that participants are not asked to apply with a ready-made solution. The solution actually has to emerge from the collaboration of participants all together. It is a product of the program. And we designed it like that on purpose because we are absolutely certain that answering social and environmental issues requires that scientists, startups, Industrials, but also NGOs, social entrepreneurs, and activists sit at the same table and work together, something that works for everyone. It is very easy to say, and a lot of people will agree with that, but it is really hard to implement. And why is so? Because of change. In a process of co-creation, everyone needs to change. Have you ever tried to make a scientist work with a company? It is more and more common today, but you will hear from those who create those connections how hard it is. Science is too slow. The researchers want to disclose everything when we need to keep our intellectual property. Or the company is pressurizing us. 
They do not ask the interesting questions. We don't care about optimizing their process. We are interested in understanding the unseen natural laws. These are the sentences that you will hear from these people. If only the corporate people were more curious and interested in the underlying explanations of things. If only the scientists were more pragmatic. Every partner wants the other one to change. And when you add activists and NGOs to the mix, the misunderstanding starts to multiply. In the end, every party might end up disappointed and saying, we're just here for the money. We did not want that for our program. Not only we designed it to really foster collaboration, but even what we call co-creation. So you can apply even if you do not have yet a solution. And you are definitely welcome to say in your application form who you would like to create your solution with. Selected participants had to convince us that they wanted to work with others, but also that they needed others to achieve their goals. We will not enter into the trap of believing that science or scientists can save us. We will make a point to have everyone concerned actually work on the solutions. Now, we realize that co-creation is working towards change in its own magical ways. We did not intend for that, but here is what happened. In 2018, we were contacted by Perrier, the sparkling water brand, to work on the tricky problem of packaging. Classical innovation methods were not so fruitful to tackle such an entangled and complex issue that is tying sustainability with technological challenges. But Perry was seduced by our approach and decided to give it a go. In 2019, we launched one of our program, The Future of Positive Packaging, that led the technical and scientific teams of Perrier to work with social entrepreneurs, NGOs, and scientists from four different continents. We were very proud of the 380 experts that manifested their interest to be part of the process and of our 41 participants that generated 15 collaborative projects. It was beautiful to see such different actors capable of co-creating projects together to tackle such a huge environmental issue. And to this day, free collaboration are still ongoing, and these are not your classical startup challenge investment deal. It looks much more like a new teamwork. Engineers and scientists from the technical centers of Perrier are working hand in hand with social entrepreneurs and NGOs from Nigeria, France, India, Southeast Asia. It is great to witness a really inclusive and responsible research happening. And the results have even led the UN to choose our program as one of the Sustainable Development Goals good practices. And yet, this is not what I will forever remember from this program. What I will remember is a little sentence pronounced by our partners that showed us how much co-creation changed them. At the beginning of 2020, I was on stage uh, of a major sustainability event with Perrier International Director to talk about the initiative. In front of several hundreds of people, and without warning me, the director of the Perrier brand announced that every competitor was welcome to join the program. I was thrilled. You know how much competition is a serious matter in our capitalistic economy. After months of working together with social entrepreneurs and change makers, the international brand wanted to transform this environmental issue into a pre-competitive topic. Profits and growth were no longer the ultimate goal. Finding a solution to a common issue was. And what seemed impossible only six months before was happening publicly. This is, I believe, the power of co-creation. When in contact with others that view the world so differently from you, you start to change. But if you are actually working on a common project, if you need their collaboration for a goal that is dear to both partners, you need to understand their point of view. 
you need to be able to put yourself in their shoes and come up with ideas you know will work also for them. That is real change. After years spent spurring co-creation, this is what I learned. Change happens the most easily, not when you decide it, but when you genuinely embrace others' point of views to make something different happen together. To succeed in the climate transition, I'm sure we need to join forces with humans from as many walks of life as possible. And I'm glad that society is succeeding in doing so in the research world. But I said science, technology, research will not be enough to actually tackle our environmental challenges. And even if the whole scientific research system focused on the environment instead of focusing on economic return, it will still not be enough. We need changes in every aspect of our lives. Now I'm going to say something a bit iconoclastic. I believe we have to go beyond human society. We have to go one step further and ask ourselves, how can we also co-create with planetary partners, with animals, with plants, with mountains? Maybe we should not concentrate so much on changing, but on seeing the world from the ocean's point of view, or the bee's point of view, or the wolf. As soon as we will be able to do so, I think change will feel effortless. I believe change is not so much about changing in itself as much as it is about connecting to others. Thank you so much. Um, there was so much in there, so I'm, I'm hoping the recording of this is also possible to digest all that was shared. Um, I so deeply love the perspective of imagine what, how we would see the world from the bee or the wolf or the mountain. Um, and I think one of the things that you both touched on is the notion of multiple perspectives and how do we have capacity to hold complexity and multiple perspectives. And so I'm delighted to be able to hand over to, um, I guess, to you. Um, would you like a question prompt or would you like to dive in? I'm happy to dive in, actually. Thank you, um, so, I, I think I want to sort of talk about, I think, the scale of this paradigm shift, the shifting of this paradigm, and the scope of it. And I think Melanie rightly hinted at a kind of new relationship of ourselves to the world. So I'm going to put down a hypothesis that pretty much a lot of our social imaginaries, Thomas Bjorkman talks about them very elegantly, social imaginaries are money is a social imaginary, right? It's a constructed reality, we construct it. But so is, I would say, ownership is a constructed reality. So is debt. These are things that we have constructed. These things have been constructed from a mindset, a mindset that was born probably as part of Newtonian physics and part of a Cartesian idea of the world. A very powerful idea. Now, that idea was about how, how humanity was in control or ideas of control of the world in that relationship. Ownership is a theory of enslavement of one thing to another. It's a big word, ownership. We enslave a piece of land to our needs. We enslave a piece of forest to our needs. We slave another human to our needs. Ownership. Now, I believe the paradigm that we're moving from is a paradigm which is constructed around a theory of control to a new relationship of ourselves with the world. Our relationship with the future, which currently is a theory of colonization. So when we talk about risks, how many of us talk about risks to us? How few of us look at the risks we generate for the future? So in a symmetrical relationship, actually what's very clear, we're at this stage working in a moment where we are focused, we are terminating the future in many, many levels. So 
Our world is terminating the future. Our current world is terminating the possibilities of the future. And that murder is unaccounted for. It's a violence which is not registered. At the same time, actually our theories of control and ownership, all these things, are manifesting in a particular way. So we have, I think, one of the big challenges for democracies is that we have no theory of long-termism or capacities for long-termism. We do not think at the 50-year cycle. We have no theory outside presentism. And I think uh, Kirsten said this very eloquently yesterday in a panel where she said, like, we value the present. Everything else has diminished. Now, that is a choice. Discount rates are a choice of how we've constructed the value of the present and discounting the future. So, for me, one of the big things that I sit with is a kind of more fundamental question of a paradigm shift and a shifting of paradigms. The idea of public and private. What is private wealth? I asked this question in a really substantive way. Is wealth possible privately if the world burns? Does money retain its value? Does a house retain its value? I'll give you a classic example. It's amazing, this place, right? If I took one of the houses, any one of these houses outside, and picked it up and put it in the middle of Russia, how much is it worth? Next to nothing. The house's value comes from its monopolistic access to all the quality of context that you live in. Pretty much all of it. So a house is not the function of the ownership of the boundary of the land. The house is a function of its relationship to public and civic goods. Yet what we create is a theory of property which is focused on the land itself. Who owns soil? And ownership as an idea is fundamentally the right to destroy it. Do any of us have the right to destroy something that has taken 10,000 years plus to build? So I suppose I sit here with a little bit like there is a fundamental shift of our relationship to the world. And that relationship is in space and time and it manifests in our institutional infrastructures. Employment. Employment contracts are an extension of servitude. You will work nine to five. You will not say anything that the company does not want you to say. Where the hell's the democracy in that? You live most of your life in enslavement. Democracy exists after five o'clock. So we have, we have not invented actually, and we have not created a theory of liberation and a theory of freedom, which is actually real. We are still living most of our times in a theory of control. So I think the emancipation that we're talking about is a much greater emancipation. It's about a new relationship with ourselves. So if you talk to indigenous leaders in Canada, they talk about a nation of trees. The trees are a nation. I think we're looking at a fundamental worldview. And that worldview is constructed because I think we constructed our worldview and our paradigm on an idea of an, a perceptibly infinite world. And in an infant world, everything was about creating objects. So you understand everything in an infant world by objectifying it. And the objectification is both in our language, the use of nouns, it's also in the idea of predictability. Melanie again mentioned how we exist in uncertainty and other things. So predictability is about objectification, making it under, under our control. So how do we operate in an age of uncertainty? And I think just to, just to bring one other thing, one other mild provocation, I think we, we often talk and operate in a theory of truths, which is fundamentally problematic. The great gift of science was not truths. The great gift of science was for us as society to hold uncertainty together. Because science is about holding uncertainty. We, e is equal to MC squared may be true, but it may not be true, almost certainly in a period of time. 
but it's a mechanism for us to socially hold uncertainty as we evolve. And too often, we are, we are sucked into theories of truths. And I think it destroys our society to be able to hold the evolution that's necessary. And that's, again, truth is an extension of this idea of objectification, objecthood, turning things into control. Now, when we start to live in a world of uncertainty and operationalize ourselves in a world of entanglement and recognizing our entanglement, how do we create, and I think our current entanglement is a quasi-entanglement which is effectively entrapment. Many of us can feel it in our bones. And the question is, here's a key word, what is freedom in an age of entanglement? What is a new theory of freedom? In an age of, is it freedom to escape or is it freedom to care? So, and I think these things manifest everywhere. They manifest in how we do all of our social imaginaries. And I, the real revolution for me is how we take these social, new social possibilities and recast these institutional infrastructures around us. That is the work of the age, because we are trapped by these codified social imaginaries into what is possible, what is not possible. And I think liberation lies in recasting those. That is the great revolution. I think that's what Frederick Melanie, that's how I see what you've been contributing, is recasting these institutional infrastructures in a really imaginative way. And I think that's a, that will create new value, new concept of value. And I'll end here that when we talk, and I mentioned this a little bit yesterday, that if you were to price the social environmental losses onto the balance sheet of companies, we're talking economic Armageddon. Even the best companies don't survive, which tells me something which tells me our theory of how we construct value and what will be the products and the lives of tomorrow will be radically different to what we perceive them to be. That requires us to reimagine ourselves and every, every revolution, every transformation has been conceptualized at reimagining what it means to be human, which is why I, f I felt Alana's contribution at the beginning was really critical. We think of ourselves as singular identities, we're not. We're a movement of identities in ourselves, plurality. We're a multitude of organisms in ourselves. Far more non-human DNA than DNA, human DNA in you. Our brain is not here. Our brain is a social construct. Yet our theories of individuality, um, self-sovereignty, all these things are constructed from an old mindset. And to approach this next revolution, I think we have to recognize the transition in ourselves, but simultaneously recode the institutional infrastructures. And we have done this before. This is not crazy. It is doable. People are doing it. And if you want to construct the next generation of value, that's where it will exist. Boy, I'm glad it's you. <laughs> I have a question. Um, because again, there's uh, there's such a, a wealth in in your capacity, and I'm curious, and it's kind of inspired by one of these questions as well, which is if there was an invitation to this group of people, to those watching, but also to our <laughs> human and maybe beyond family outside, what is the what is the invitation you have for them to step into this new paradigm? You can touch anything. Anything you touch. If you're HR, reimagine your H employment contract. If you're, if you're a CFO, reimagine your theory of your balance sheet. It is a profit loss balance sheets are a very, very narrow American model imported since the 1960s. Look at 1950s Ita Italian Marshall Fund institutions, four way uh, balance sheet models. You can literally touch anything. And Everything changes, and, I'm, and you're going to see it in front of you, and you'll see the value. So I, I, I don't believe this is a hierarchical problem. If you're, if you're looking at the future of institutions, reimagine the, the IMF, because we're going to have to do that. If you're working on democracy, our industrial democracy is not fit for purpose in a complex emergent world, which is real-time changing. Embrace structural change. The world that has been gifted to you 
is out of date and it is not ever present true. And we have recast it over and over again. One example, 1833, the UK abolished slavery. Do you know what it did? This is in the middle of the UK empire, right? 648 million people, 648 million people. They took 25% of GDP, 25%, we argue about 0.5%. They took 25% of GDP and abolished slavery by compensating, compensating the slave owners. It was problematic, but they did it. They've compensated the slave owners because the, slave, the, the ownership was collateralized with the banks, which were, refunded the banks, which then started the second industrial revolution. The scale of what is possible has been done in our history. And I fear we're trapped in the presentism, which I think is a lock-in of powers that currently exist that do not want to embrace the change. But you can touch anything. You can touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know we've only got three and a bit minutes left, so I'm wondering to each of you, Frederick and Melanie, what your equivalent invitation, but if you can do the short version. <laughs> um, Melanie, uh, what is your invitation? Yeah, I, I think something that Indy said that is very interesting is that we are stuck in the present. Um, and my invitation would be to think of how you can connect the past to the future. We've talked a lot about uh, the different revolution we've seen. Uh, Frederick talked about the agriculture revolution. Then we talked about the industrial one. Um, and I, I really think we need to have deep um, thoughts in what is our past, where we are coming from and why our world is what it is today and how can we better connect the past to what will happen in the future. And if I talk about the future is of course because I'm a scientist and in the labs we are always watching towards the future, um, but in a very specific way. Um, and now what we need to do, I believe, is try to better embrace what we were doing before, what was working, because this environmental issue is quite new somehow, if you look at the history of uh, the earth. Um, and so how can we better understand where we are coming from, what we were doing thousands of years ago, that of course we cannot do anymore the, the same way, but make it something that can work in the future. And so, yes, indeed, stop trying to be so much stuck in the present truth, because what is true today will not be true tomorrow. I think it's extremely important. Thank you very much. Um, Frederick, you are uh, challenged and invited to do a very summarized version. <laughs> Ah, and you are on silent, so we will do interpretive translation. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I would just love to take in this invitation and make it personal. I think for a lot of us, and I think a lot of people in the room, if you're a CEO or a CFO or a politician, embracing this new thing feels dangerous, right? It, it, you might get kicked out of the system if you push the system too hard. And so there's this sort of unconscious but collective fear of breaking out into the new. And I just want to challenge that. Like, I remember the time that I made a decision for myself. I'm going to work on the new because this is just so much more exciting. And realize, like, I think everybody in this room, none of us is ever going to starve of hunger. All of us will make a living somehow. So the real risk here is not a real risk. It's just a risk to our ego, right? And so it's really an invitation to this decision of do I continue pushing this old world that is dying or do I accept Indy's invitation and Melanie's invitation and try to invent these new things, however exciting they are, even if it feels risky, but it's just a little risk for my ego. Yes. Like somehow I will survive and most likely this will be much more joyful. I will meet much more interesting people. My children will be so proud of me. Like, you know, this is, this is just where the fun is going to be. 
Thank you. With 10 seconds to spare, thank you. Thank you, Melanie, thank you. Thank you to everybody for participating. Um, there are cards on each of your chairs and the invitation is with courage to go and speak to somebody you don't yet know and have a real conversation with them. Um, my invitation as we started and as I close is to breathe. Um, thank you very much and we will see you again later. Thank you. Thank you.